You're listening to the Jersey Guys Podcast, the show that talks about hard rock, heavy metal, AOR, and West Coast music. In-depth conversation and special guests are always on tap, so settle in and turn it up. Now, here are your hosts, Tom and Mark. Hey everybody, welcome to the Jersey Guys Podcast. This is Mark Ballow and I'm here with my co-host Tom Coyne. And today we're coming with a brand new episode. Uh, Today we're talking with Jerome Mazza. Uh, Of course, the band Pinnacle Point uh, has two releases out, uh, very Kansas-like. Jerome has a solo album out. And he also was the uh, vocalist in Angelica back in the 90s, early 90s, right? Uh, Great stuff, uh, great singer. And we're going to talk to him today about all that stuff and more. So uh, let's get right to the interview. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Jersey Guys podcast. I'm Mark, and I'm here with my co-host, Tom, as always. And today we've got very special guest, Jerome Mazza. Uh, Welcome, Jerome. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate your time today. Um, What I thought I would do is, and Tom's got a lot of questions, I know, about some of your albums, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your your early days prior to your recordings. Uh, Let's go back to, you know, the days of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Talk about your early days and uh, how you got into singing. Oh, okay. Wow. (laughs) Uh, Wow. How did I get into it? Well, you know, I I was a big, uh, let me see, I was probably 10 years old when I heard, uh, my brother used to play this band called Grand Funk Railroad. You guys probably know them. Sure. But, uh, and uh, Mark Farner's voice was just, I just loved his voice and I loved the band. But uh, I, I, I just thought, wow, what a voice, you know, and I used to try to, uh, Mind you, I'm only like 10 years old, 11 years old. Tried to uh, sound like him a little bit. You know, tried, that's, how, that's kind of how I started learning to sing was by him, his, his albums, the Grand Funk albums, learning how to sing like Mark. And was, how did you, what did you, did you eventually end up getting into some, some local bands there and singing? Or how did, how did you, uh-huh. your career progress? Yeah, I, I did. I, I actually play guitar as well. And, um, I wasn't really singing much, you know, uh, here and there, whatever. And uh, auditioned for a uh, uh, like a show band. It was a show band, top forty show band. This would have been well wow, back in '79, I think. And uh, uh, I went out there to audition as a uh, guitar player because one of my buddies that I used to jam with said to this leader of this band, "Hey, he's a great singer too." And I didn't sing live. I never sung a note live, right? So I thought I was going out to audition for uh, as a guitar player. And he said, well, you have to sing. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I, uh, he said, do you sing? And I said, yeah, I sing a little bit. So anyway, I started singing along with, you know, a couple of songs we were uh, playing. And apparently they loved my singing. So that's the first time I thought, well, Hey, maybe I have something here. Maybe maybe I can't sing. So that was like 1979. Wow. You know, kind of a flute thing. You know. Now at this so, point, you had you said you went out. Does that did you relocate relocate to the West Coast? Oh well, that was later on though. Oh. Yeah, this uh, we didn't get out to L.A. back. We, well, let me see. We went out there and the uh, oh boy, that was would have been 91. Oh, several okay. years later. Yeah. Yeah, several years later. But yeah, I played. I played show bands, top 40 bands, rock bands. We did a lot of progressive rock uh, all through the Pittsburgh area. And then we played uh, up and down, a little bit up and down the East Coast. And mostly show bands, you know, where you do a week like at a Holiday Inn or whatever and that sort of thing. And then uh, then I was playing lo- locally rock, you know, got into rock and just, I guess, till I was about, till I got married, I guess, about like 82. Okay. I was playing band. Yeah. Interesting. So that's how I got started. Yeah. So then talk about like you mentioned uh, Grand Funk Railroad, Mark Farner being a, a vocal influence. Uh, how about the, the whole Kansas influence? Because we're going to get to obviously uh, the Pinnacle Point records that you've done. And uh, sure. I just how did you get into the, the whole Kansas influence? And you also, you know, sang on the Steve Walsh solo album in 2017. Uh, okay. So, yeah, let's let's talk about that. Was Kansas a big influence when you were growing up? 
it was a massive influence. I, I just happened to be uh, one of my buddies was had. Let me see, I was 14, and uh, he had a big party at his house. And like I said back then, I was a big Leonard Skinner fan, Grand Funk fan. Never heard of Kansas. Yeah. And I think it was the Mask album that came out in '74. And I, I was in another room, and I heard in, on the other side of the house this voice and this this violin. And I thought, what the hell is that? You know, that is so cool. I mean, it's like rock with the violin and that voice. And that's when I actually started to get into Kansas, and I was just blown away. I was just, it was just, I don't know why, although I, now that I'm older, I think my mom used to play a lot of, like, classical music growing up, along with big band. And uh, I just thought, because I, I was kind of into that music, at a young age, and obviously I was into rock, you know, being 14. I think it was that combination that really got me. Um, but Steve's voice was just, I just, you know, I just was blown away by his voice. Became a big Kansas fan after that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Well, that actually yeah. was the Kansas album that I got into, too. I believe I was a sophomore in high school when that album came out, Mask. And yeah. it's it's yeah. it's funny that you said that because that's the first exposure I had to them too, and then I had to go back okay. to, the, to to the the albums before it. But I always, yeah, yeah they they kind of affected me the same way. Uh, Jethro yeah. Tull and and Kansas, the um, the oddities of the, the hard rock sound that those two bands had had an enormous uh, impact on me. And I'm also old enough to say that I saw Grand Funk in their heyday at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Really? No kidding. That was a big one, I think, there, huh? Yeah. In the early 70s, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. You know, the thing with them is, uh, just to, to digress before we get into your other uh, releases, um, as big as they were, I don't think people over the years appreciated what a phenomena they were. You know, I've told people that didn't even realize that they sold out Shea Stadium. I, I grew up in New York, and I remember what... A big th they literally sold out 56,000 seats at, at Shea Stadium. And a lot of people don't even realize that. Yeah. Quicker than the Beatles. I yes. Think. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. That's right. Absolutely. And I just found yeah. Farm Fauna over the years really doesn't get quite the recognition as, as, a, as a front man singer and guitar player that a lot yeah. of other, you know, guys have gone it over the years. I just I just find that for some reason they didn't quite resonate through all the decades with people and they kind of got lost in the shuffle of the the, the greatness and, and influence that they had on hard rock at the time. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. And the lyrics as well. Oh like yeah. Mark Mark was singing about, you know, people that stopped the war, mm -hmm. you know, singing about social problems and things way back. And they just weren't love songs or whatever, you know. They were, like, very deep lyrics as well. I, th I thought, anyway. I did, too. Cool. And I was also a big Skinned fan, also. I had I had tickets to see them at Madison Square Garden with Ted Nugent, um, and the plane crash happened shortly before. I, st I still have the ticket to this day. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So yeah. I want to just jump into, how did you get hooked up with uh, Angelica and uh, Dennis Cameron? How did that all come about?
Okay. Well, I was, uh, well, I had, I, at the time, this, now this would have been 1989, and I had a, uh, I was a salesman for a best foods baking group. <laughs> we used to go out and sell to grocery stores, you know, and, uh, and uh, so that was my day job, and I was kind of playing around with me. I had gotten out of music after I got married, and uh, kind of had a little home studio, and I was just kind of, you know, goofing around with it as a sideline. And I happened to see, you guys probably know, it's a Music Connection magazine out of L.A. I don't know if you've heard of that. I, I you know, yeah. I've actually seen copies of it sold on eBay. That's how I know <laughs> of it. I don't, I okay. don't own any, any of them, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think I have a couple okay, issues. Yeah. <laughs> It's like we're all the guys who, you know, the wannabes, I guess, want to try to get get a gig. But anyway, I saw this uh, this ad because it was sent to my home in Florida. I was living in Florida at the time, and uh, I saw the ad. Uh, Dennis Dennis Cameron put the ad in, and uh, I sent him a tape. And about two weeks later, he called me back and said, "Hey, I was blown away by uh, your tape. Would you like to be on an album?" And I thought, "Wow, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do it." And I was laying sod in my backyard when he called. I'll never forget that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, he he said, uh, "Yeah, well, well, I'm coming down." It, I think he called me. Oh, geez, I think about October, November of '89, and he said, "I'll be in Florida because I'm going to record there in Braden, uh, Bradenton, which is about an hour from my home." And so he he came to Florida. We hooked up, came to my house, and we sat around just chit chatted a little while and. Um, he said, "Yeah, you want to do it?" I said, "Absolutely, let's do it." So uh, that's how that's how we hooked up. And what happened after that was he he uh, wanted to come to Florida to to do some pre pro, and I said, well, "Why don't you just come to my house?" You know, because I had extra room, big room there, and he could come and set up some gear, and you know, and maybe a couple of weeks of pre pro, we could just work together on it, whatever. And uh, so that's what he did. He came down. He stayed with us for like I don't know about five weeks, six weeks, or whatever, and did the album and everything else. And that's how how that happened. It's pretty cool. Now let me ask you something, just out of, out of curiosity, especially at this era. Did you at the time identify as a Christian artist, and did you have to be a Christian artist to sing in or play in Christian bands at that time? No, I, I don't even think he asked me. You know, I'm a Catholic. You know, um, but um, was I a Christian? Um, I guess I am a Christian. It's just that uh, a born again Christian. No, I right. was not. Okay. But it didn't matter to him. You okay. know, it was just whatever. He just wanted a, a singer for the album. Interesting, because um, I've always wondered that. You know, there's always been misnomers uh, as to you know Christian artists and people say, well, yeah. you know, they're really not as religious as they say. And I've always wondered, just uh, in my own mind when you played in bands, especially at that era, because there was like the advent of, of everything that came off of Striper. There were mm -hmm. so many melodic hard rock bands at the time uh, that were identifying as quote unquote Christian artists. So it's just right. something that I was always uh, curious about. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, uh, uh, yeah, he, he definitely, it didn't, we had that little bit of a conversation, not much about it, you know, but, uh, he said, well, I want you on this album. I said, sure. You know, that's, uh, love to do it. So worked out. Now you had mentioned, um, that you were a salesman doing, uh, your regular job, nothing to do with music. Um, but you also, were, were you involved in like sessions and jingle work at some point? Was that prior to yeah. that? Yeah, well, what happened was then, uh, let me see, this would have been, uh, I had a, uh, a, a, I actually was able to buy a portion of uh, the, the job that I had, and I kind of had my own little business there till 91, and I sold it in 91, and uh, this was right after we, Dennis and I did the uh, Angelica album, and uh, kind of, I, it, was a, it was an opportunity to sell my business, so I sold it. And my wife said, hey, why don't we go out to L.A., you know, just for like six months and just see what we could do out there. And I thought, yeah, OK, because, you know, we'll go out for six months and we'll come back and whatever. So happened to go out to L.A. and uh, I started pounding the pavement and I started getting all kind of work for commercials. So I did a lot of uh, marketing firms would hire me to to do jingles like uh, Coors Beer, Pizza Hut, HBO. I was on like some some B movie type uh, movies. And uh, what else did I do? 
uh, oh, I did a lot of uh, demos for songwriters. Uh, somehow I got into EMI, and the guys that were working with Wilson Phillips, I think, at the time, I was demoing songs for those guys. Wow. And Which I thought was really cool. And, and was it Air Supply? I, I can't remember, but yeah, I was doing an awful lot of demos, you wow. know, like five demos a day. You know, it, it was it was great, but wow. um, you know, I kind of burned out, and then we uh, we kind of went back to Florida after that. After about five years of that, you know, we just went back home. So. Oh, okay. Now we had uh, as a, guest, a past guest, Tom and I had uh, Dave Bickler from Survivor, uh, and he was he was very heavily involved in the whole jingle thing at some point too. You know, early in his career. Um, but yeah, uh-huh. I, I know a lot of guys that we've spoken with and other guys we've had as guests too have also been involved in that line of work. So it's pretty interesting and you can make, you know, make a career out of it. Yeah. I mean, what I was working with, uh, God, I can't remember the writer's name. He was a great writer out there. Uh, I'm not sure. I, yes. He was with EMI or Geffen. One of, at the time there was a guy, I don't know if Geffen music is still around, but, um, he was writing for Wilson Phillips and, and other big names that I can't remember. But the pay was great, you know, it was, you know, it was crazy. And I'd walk in and I'd sing like 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's your day. Here you go. See you later. You know, it's <laughs> like, wow. Well, yeah. we have enough, you know. <laughs> wow. But yeah, it was it was fun. It was a lot of fun back then. So I wanted that. to just go back to the uh, Angelica album, uh, Walking in Faith. That album um, at the time was um, uh, uh, more like uh, underground especially with the changing yeah. musical scene at the time. But people that uh, knew it, like myself, they're kept abreast of all the Christian artists as, as well as the non-Christian artists. It was very, very highly thought of in terms of guitar playing, singing, um, song structure. Was this the sound that you kind of, as a musician, were identifying with, like the, the melodic, hard rock sound of like the late 80s, early 90s? You're talking about the Angelica album now? Yes, Walking in Faith, yeah. Yeah, no, I actually have a story about that. I was never into heavy metal. And when Dennis gave me the demos, he also said, can you, is it possible that you could sound like Tony Harnell? Yeah. Hmm. To, do you know who Tony Harnell sure, is? Sure, TNT. TNT, yes. TNT. I actually, TNT. That, that Angelica album reminds me a lot of TNT in, in points for various songs. Really? No kidding. Yeah. Okay. Well, the story, <laughs> the story, that's great that you say that. But the story behind that was he said, I, I really want you to sing more like Tony Harnell. Can you do that? And I said, I don't know. I've, I've never sung metal. <laughs> you know, I would sing. I was singing Journey and uh, Kansas and, uh, you know, Boston, whatever. And uh, never did any metal. He said, well, it's going to be a metal album. I want you to sound like uh, Tony Harnell. <laughs> so, okay, fine. You know, I, I, I got TNT. Uh, what was it? Uh, Intuition. All right. And I, I studied his voice, and I just, every day I'd practice to sound like Tony. And uh, that's that was something that I had to prepare for to do. Interesting. So, yeah, interesting, yeah, for sure. Uh, the but, reason I ask, because you, you had spoken about, you know, your influences with Kansas, and I, I didn't know whether you were going in that direction of a, of a harder edge sound, or it was the direction just kind of found you. It found me, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened with that? You know, you did the one. He had an album before that where he had a, a young at the time Rob Rock before he became a household name in this music. Sang on the first one. Um, yeah. How did he move from Rob Rock to to you? And part two of my question is, why didn't you stay in the band for the following albums? I, he just, for some reason, he wanted to change singers for, he's had several different singers on there. And I think he ended up singing himself. I think Dennis always wanted to sing himself. Mm. And I think he, he did, I think by the fourth album, I think it was. Yes. Uh, he had sung many uh, tunes on it. But I don't know. I, I think uh, for me, I I didn't want to do another one anyway. He didn't ask me, but I probably wouldn't have done it anyway. But uh, I... I don't know. I think he just wanted to try different singers. I think eventually he wanted to sing. And he tried different styles too. The third album, Rock, yeah. Stock, and Barrel, had a had a funky element on some of the songs that the, the yeah. album you were yeah. on. And then his fourth right. album, where he he did sing uh, on some of the tracks, was uh, 
little more acoustic -y, you know, like more, more yeah. laid back approach. So really he yeah. did have, like the first two albums were more metal and then, you know, his, his, his styles did change as, right. as, he, as he progressed. So right. where did you, at that point, where, where were you had bef long before we, before we hook up to Khalil Turk and we'll, we'll get into all that. Where were you musically now? Where it was somewhere in the nine, mid nineties out of it i uh we we left l a in ninety six or ninety eight now i can't remember but i had burned out i uh i was sitting let me see it was nineteen ninety two we had just gotten to l a in ninety one june of ninety one and about six months or eight months later i was sitting at michael Amardian's studio uh michael Amardian was at the time was up for producer of the year with Amy Grant, Heart in Motion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys remember that album. I, I'm familiar with uh, him. I actually have one of his solo albums. Okay. Well, I was sitting, uh, I had hooked up with a songwriter out in L.A., and his father knew Michael Amartin, and he got us a, uh, a sit-down with Michael, and we were sitting in his studio, and, <clears throat> you know, I, I actually thought I was going to be recording with the great Michael Amartin, and all of a sudden kind of just didn't work out the songs were good enough or you know uh, i don't know what happened but it kind of fizzled out so i i did a few more years of you know recording and trying to get something going out there we just kind of gave up at like 96 and we moved back to florida and i was done you know that was it for me i wasn't doing anything after 96 yeah so tell us a little bit how pinnacle point how did you come back into music? And it's not shocking that you, you went in the Kansas style for your, your love of them. How did that all initially come off the ground? I can see the sun is shining and spring is at the door. With their face and I can't take it anymore. and her mom were on me this was several years later it would have been 2014 now um what are you gonna do you know you know, with that voice you got to do something okay so I, I i i had some songwriter friends out in la and we decided to do just a project for the fun of it you know it was kind of like a josh groban which is my first album uh, solo album of 2015 it's self-titled mm-hmm and it's like Josh Groban with a little little edge to it, maybe. Yeah, a little, very and, uh, adult contemporary, very uh, yeah. yeah, mellow. Yeah, like Michael like Bolton. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. totally. Exactly. And uh, so we did that. You know, I did that. I did it myself and produced it. And uh, my buddies wrote pretty much all the songs on it. And for we just happened to put it up on... Uh, oh, it was through a small label that's no longer around. But they put it up on... Uh, somehow, Torben and Volsen in Sweden... Uh, the guitar player, Pinnacle Point, heard a song on that album 
um, that I wrote called What Will It Take? And it was it was a ballad, and he said, man, he, he messaged me and said, you sound like Steve Walsh on that song. And he said, would you like to do a project? So that's how Torbett and I, with Pinnacle Point, hooked up. He heard that one song on uh, on my first album. And uh, so we talked. This was this probably uh, December of um, 2014. Yeah, 2014. And we talked about doing a project, and, and uh, we we both – we're big Kansas fans and street fans and uh, he's a big deep purple fan. And we just kind of threw all those elements in together and started writing songs like that. And that's how pinnacle point one winds of change was created. Well, that's how we hooked up. It's yeah. Quite an he album. Just messaged me on. It, oh, thanks. It um, got a lot of people's attention when it came out and uh, yeah. the streets, Kansas influence are uh, very much the forefront. Yeah. Um, if yeah. you could tell us about some of the some of your favorite songs on the album and see if they match mine and Mark's. On Winds of Change. On uh, yeah. yeah, the first one. Uh, well, damage is done. I mean, that uh, Torben wrote that entirely, and uh, it was just a kick kick butt song. And we did a video on it, and that's how we hooked up. That's how I hooked up with uh, Khalil. From he, that, from he that point. He saw the video. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he saw the damage is done video. We we just put out. He saw it in like two days, and I get a call at five in the morning, and he said, "Listen, I saw your uh, your video. Would you like to uh, be on a Steve Walsh album?" And I just I've wiped my eyes. I'm thinking, "What is this? Is this real? What's going on here?" You know, it's. Uh, I said, "Yeah, <laughs> absolutely." <laughs> so that's how that happened. You know, he saw damage is done. Um, Torben, my favorite songs on there. I guess damage is done. Um, I like I like them all. I think they're all yeah. It's a really strong things. album. It it really is. There's no no letdowns in it at all. Now, when you were recording yeah. it, what was the intent to do a second album? Like at that point, was Khalil pushing you, or not pushing, you, but it was behind the uh, the force behind a second album, or was your intent all along to make this a, an ongoing project? Yeah, the second album. Uh, well, right after the Winds of Change, we did. I, I did the Black Butterfly with Steve, and then I did a solo album for Khalil right after that. Khalil, after that, right. and uh, Pinnacle Point Two. He wanted to do a Pinnacle Point Two, but there were some things there that kind of, you know, there were a lot of um, obstacles. I would say, <laughs> but uh, uh, well, but we got it done. We got it done, and it, it took about two and a half years to do it, but we got it done. Like, well, for one one thing, Torben was so busy; he had five projects going on at the same time. I was doing Outlaw Sun. Um, we couldn't find the time to write. Um, there and there were some other things going on, but you know, eventually we got it done, and uh, yeah, I, I think it turned out pretty good. Oh, yeah, it was yeah, very good for sure. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about you mentioned the the Outlaw Sun solo album, uh, two thousand seventeen, was it? Yes. Um, no, that that would have been uh, eighteen. Eighteen. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about how that. I mean, you mentioned that it was kind of the the force behind that was was Khalil um, from Escape Music, but tell us a little bit about how the you know the, the project came about and some of the players you had on that album.
Yeah, that uh, that was great. Um, well, I had worked with uh, Tommy Denander, who, who I, I just you know, and Steve Overland, who I think the world of those two guys. Uh, Tommy, Tommy to me is like I, I've I've heard a lot of guitar players, but he's just like uh, he never sounds the same on on any song. It's just he's just an incredible guitar player. He could play any style too, but. So I worked, and Steve Overland is probably the nicest guy you're ever going to meet. I mean, Steve is just, uh, he was just awesome because I, when I worked with both of them on uh, Black Butterfly, Steve was so, hey, you need anything, let me know, you know, and uh, just just so cool to work with. And I was a little nervous working with those guys, hmm. but Steve was such a good guy, you know. But uh, anyway, so I, when Leo had mentioned, I want to do a solo album and with Steve and Tommy writing for you. You don't have to write anything. He'll just write it. I said, I'm in. I mean, geez, are you kidding? Yeah. So absolutely. And it was great. You know, it took, a, I think it only took about three months for to get this, the right songs. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I was just, I, I really wanted, I really enjoyed working with him, uh, on both projects. It was just a blast to work with those guys. So great, great, great experience. Well, that's yeah. great stuff because you talk about, you know, we talked about Pinnacle Point. You talked about your love of Kansas and now you go to your solo album. And I right off the bat, when I listen to Outlaw Sun, I get a real strong journey vibe. And I know that's a band you just mentioned a little bit ago. Exactly. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. Oh, there's a couple of uh, what's the song? Uh, oh, man. Last Goodbye, maybe. I think it's Last Goodbye. I think has a little journey. That's the fifth vibe track, the Last Goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. A few do, yeah. But they're great writers. I mean, they're just great writers. Both yeah, of them. it was a very well put together album for sure. And then, like I said, your vocals yeah. just just kind of <laughs> topped it all off. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Is that way? Is that a, a, an oh. area that you really um, feel comfortable? Like that more AOR as the the term mm -hmm. is uh, that the term is is that an area that you're I've always been comfortable in singing. No, actually, I'm I'm more into the Pinnacle Point stuff. To be honest with you, okay. I um yeah, I was such a major Kansas fan. And actually, when Halil had mentioned you want to do this Outlaw Sun, it's going to be more you know commercial radio type stuff. And I thought, well, I'm not sure that's right for me. But he kept saying, no, we'll do it. Let's try it. Let's try it. And I think it. And he was right. You know, I I I, I did it. I think it turned out fantastic. And uh, I'm glad I did it. You know, it was different, a little different for me, but. Uh, but more, I'm more into the. Uh, I love the progressive stuff. You know. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do Pinnacle too. Point. I mean, I, I, yeah, I like everything. I like metal. <laughs> I like metal. I like pro progressive. I, like, you know, I, I always say, and I, me and Mark have talked about this quite a bit. If it's got good singing, good songs, and good guitar playing, I like it. Yeah, you know? those are my, yeah. my the, the three yeah. things I always look for in music: the guitar player, the singer, and the song structure. Yeah, totally agree with you. Yeah. Absolutely. Will there be a third pinnacle point? We're kicking it around. Yeah, Torben and I are kicking it around. Where he's uh, he's finishing up like three projects right now. <laughs> he's like working constantly, and uh, so we were just talking a couple of weeks ago. We're just kind of we're doing. We may be doing some work for someone else. I'm not allowed to mention, um, but uh, so we're kind of waiting to see what's happening with that before we do another pinnacle, if we do one. So. That's that's what's uh, that's what's happening right now. Will there uh, will there be as Khalil mentioned? There anything about maybe another solo album also? Well, it could be. You know, I uh, I be honest with you. After Pinnacle Point Two, I kind of needed a break because I had done like five albums in five years or whatever it was. Yeah, you you uh, made up for all the years you weren't <laughs> in music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So. You know, it was right after I had a couple of months off. I thought, boy, this is great, you know. And uh, but I'm kind of, I may be ready to get back into doing something. I, I, I may want to do another solo if, if Leo wants to do another one. I may do one. Okay. Um, talk about we we mentioned it a little bit, and uh, you talked about it a little bit. But how did the whole uh, getting involved with the Steve Walsh uh, album, solo album, uh, Black Butterfly, come about? Yeah, well, the, I got the phone call, as I mentioned, you know, at 5 a.m. in the morning. And uh, it wasn't a phone call. I'm sorry. It was a uh, a text from our uh, Facebook message from Halil. And I didn't rec – it's funny. You know, I didn't recognize – I was half asleep, didn't recognize the name, and I blew it off. 
it, it's, it, it's funny. It's, you know, my name is blah, 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 blah. I'm with Escape Music, and I was half asleep, and I just went, what? What? Who's this? <laughs> eh. You know, I went and got another cup of coffee, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I come back in, and I hear, bing, bing, you know, there, here he is again. There's like three messages on there. So I read it, wiped my eyes, and he didn't say who he was at that point. He said, do you want to be on a Steve Walsh album? Hmm. And I went, what the hell is this? You know, what is this? <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> what, does this mean? <laughs> what is the meaning so of I this? Said, yeah, do you want to be on a Steve Walsh album? I thought, uh, yeah, can I, sure, you know? <laughs> and he said, can I call you right now? I said, absolutely. So he calls me, <laughs> he calls me 5 a.m. And uh, he said he had heard, dam- or saw the uh, video, uh, Damage is Done. And he said, Steve was, uh, I don't know, taking a break or something. And he said, uh, would you want to help out? You know, he may need you for a song or two. And I said, yeah, sure. Absolutely. You kidding me? That's my idol. You know, that's that's my singing idol right there. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's, it, I mean, how many people get that opportunity? You know, it's crazy. Of course, yeah. But so I said, absolutely. I'd love to do it. Next thing I know, a week later, I'm in the studio um, cutting Have Mercy on Me was the first one that he gave me. the audition i imagine so they loved it and i got a call you know right after i got home after doing the song they said steve loves it you're in and i just i couldn't believe it you know i just couldn't believe it mm. that i was gonna um and um so Khalil said uh would you be open to singing a few more i said sure absolutely and maybe a duet and i said yeah so that's how it happened you know it's just after that first song they they knew i could i could do it help them out and it and i ended up doing what i think four songs in a duet i think it i think it that's what it was yeah three but, three uh, songs three songs in a duet i think it was or am maybe I, three yeah. yeah there's there's one song that was a it was a uh, uh release in japan an extra song oh okay uh, a bonus track i think oh gotcha okay yeah I, yeah do you have that tom i, I do have that. <laughs> tom's the completest so he, he i'm sure he has <laughs> there's it. no bonus track that uh that slips past me <laughs> yeah Right. So uh, it, this is it was great. I mean, I, I really appreciate the conversation here. Do you have uh, some website uh, or socials that fans can keep up uh, up to date with what you're doing? Yeah, it's uh, Jerome Mazza dot com. And it's got you know all the albums up there and information if anything news have coming up or whatever. It's, it's it would be on there. I wanted to ask you before we actually go um, the first solo album that you did. And you said it was 2015, I believe. That's 14, correct. 15. Um, I, was that on CD or it was more of like an independent release, right? So it wasn't too widely distributed? You know, it was on a, an album, or I'm sorry, a label uh, 
called Tape Publishing or Tape Music or something like that, but they've they're, they've been out of business a long time. Oh, okay. That's five years or so they've been gone. I think I had to but, download yeah. it from your uh, from your site. I had to buy it uh, digitally because <laughs> I couldn't find yeah, a hard it, copy. A, yeah, I think we have. I think we only have downloads. Yeah, of okay. that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I didn't know something like that. Now that you've gotten your profile back up over the last number of years, that's something you might consider. Uh, you know, putting out on on CD again or something like that. Yeah, we know we get people looking for it. Actually, believe it or not, yeah, yeah, they want to know about it. Get on Khalil about it. He'll, I'll get in his ear. <laughs> I mentioned it to him. Okay. I, I said, "Hey, would, would you like to uh, re-release this?" He says, "Oh, it's too laid back." <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's just too laid back. Yeah, it's not rock. You know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard for him to market then on through his yeah. Through escape. Yeah. Well, um, Jerome, uh, Tom, and I really appreciate this conversation today. Um, got some great stories and. Uh, that's what we always like to get, you know, so that, that was some good stuff there. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, it was great. Yeah, great hooking up with you guys and meeting you, and uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jerome. Appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate okay, it bye. very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Uh, so we just did the interview with Jerome Mazza. Uh, Tom, uh, what do you think of this one? I thought it was a pretty good one. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, having him on. Uh, I've always been a big fan of his vocals and really like the fact that he's back involved in um, in our music once again. Yeah. Now he sounds like uh, he, he did the Angelica album back in 1990 and didn't do anything for a, a whole bunch of years. And it seems the last five, six, seven years, he's been uh, everything. Pinnacle Point, solo album, Steve Walsh. So, uh, yeah, he was a pretty good guest and uh, I really enjoyed talking to him. I know you were the one that kind of turned me on to the uh, the Pinnacle Point stuff. So, uh, and yeah, I know, yeah, it's, it's Pinnacle Point is like, if you like this stuff and you probably heard, we're going to play a song, uh, you know, as you're listening to this, but uh, it, it's very much, it's like a Kansas clone, right? At points, uh, I, I would say he would have been uh, a great replacement for Walsh in Kansas, but I don't know if that was ever in the... In the play for him, I guess we could have asked him that. We'll mm. wait for that now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we could speculate. There you go. But uh, yeah, very, very Kansas-like. Yeah, no, and I really, and I was telling you this before we uh, we started the podcast. I I really love his solo album, uh, Outlaw Sun. I think that's a great album and very different. You know, we talked about this in the interview. It was the Pinnacle Point stuff is very Kansas sounding, but his solo album is very. AOR journey sounding and you know obviously you got a guy like Tommy Denander involved in that uh, songwriting so you know it's going to be a little more melodic and stuff but yeah I really enjoy his solo album a lot yeah and uh, I, I kind of liked how we talked a little bit about the Christian scene at the time and um, how we got hooked up with Angelica and the writing process how um, he was kind of giving instructions to sound like Tony Harnell yeah that was pretty funny it was uh, a little enlightening yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so that was our uh, our episode with uh, Jerome Mazza, and uh, we'll be back with another one real soon. Bye.